time. I always make mistakes and I hope I, I was having problems with my camera uh, yesterday I, I, and I changed it. So I hope it's going to work okay because it's fine it's, now. Yeah, okay. I'm a bit stalled. But... Oh. Okay, I think we are online already. We already have some people here. So uh, we can talk, and uh, but people can, can only write. Uh, so in the end, when they make questions, they will have have it written, and I will read it. I, I can put it on the screen for you. Okay. And, uh, and I'll read it anyway. So okay, it's, that's fine. That's good. And how is everybody? How is Stefan? Great. Yeah, he's heading to work soon. I think he's still at home, but <laughs> we've been working at home kind of on and off, but uh, I've, I've been coming into the lab more often now. But yeah, he's great. Kids are great. Nell's in first year university with his neck. Can you believe it? No. Really? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's so crazy. Uh, I remember, you know, when she was still crevette. Yes. <laughs> She's not anymore. She's almost as tall as me, I'd say. So she's she's not as and Max is uh, like head and shoulders taller than Matt, uh, Steph now. Wow. He's he really shot up. I think COVID was really good for him because you know concentrated growth time. He was like. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're good. Looking forward to traveling again and. Yeah, I meetings. Know. Like I, I really miss going to meetings in person. Yeah, me remember too. The, the last time we were together in Keystone. It was so much fun that that meeting. Yeah, that was one of the best meetings I've been to. Like I have such good memories of that time. It was so yeah, fun. that was really good. Oh, that was such yeah, a good so time. I hope next year we'll be able to. Yeah, I think so too. I'm I think I even know. miss the things that I didn't like. I miss. So. I know it's true, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be normal-ish. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can start. I know you have some other things after that. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dana. It's, it's hard to believe, but we've known each other for like 20 years, almost 20 years. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's great. And uh, so I already written a little biography from Dana in the email that I sent to everyone. Uh, and I just would like to uh, highlight like uh, some things. And Dana was um, after doing her PhD in the University of Toronto and uh, postdoc at McMaster. She went on to work with Philippe Sonsonetti in the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Uh, where she was studying uh, Shigella Flexneri and its interaction with the host. Uh, and um, she was a, a pioneer, let's say, and she was one of the first people to uh, study the role of Nod proteins uh, in how her group, together with uh, Gabriel Nunes, were the, the first to describe many aspects of these proteins, uh, the ligands, the signaling, its interactions uh, mm -hmm. with microbiota and many aspects of the host immune, se uh, immune system. Uh, in 2006, she went back to Toronto to start to uh, uh, where she's now. Uh, and working with, still working with nod proteins and microbiota and uh, innate immunity. And uh, she has had a very uh, productive and very, uh, very important contributions to this field. And so I'm really, really happy to have her here. Uh, I've been trying to ha to bring her to Brazil for the last 20 years, and every time something happens, <laughs> so I said this time nothing will happen because you know it's online. She will be here, but I still bring you here in person. Yes, some so meeting. Nice. <laughs> really nice. So thank you so much, Dan. I'm really really happy to have you here, and I'm really really curious to to you know we, we haven't talked for so long and to to know what you're doing and what's going on in your lab. 
it's kind of always be a little bit my lab too. So uh, I'm really happy to have you here. So thank you. That's so nice. Thank you so much for, for inviting me and that really nice introduction, that she said, so, so nice. Um, and I think many of you know, yes, as she mentioned, that she was uh, you know, doing her PhD, part of her PhD work in my lab and, and Stéphane Chardin's lab in Paris, and then moved to, to uh, Toronto with us and uh, had a really productive postdoc. And, you know, it's, it's amazing that, you know, the work that both Leticia and also Lea Traversos did in our labs is kind of the foundation of the work that we're still doing, you know, the work on um, stress response and, and its impact on immunity with HRI and also with autophagy. So we're still, you know, really interested in those subjects. Um, and uh, I guess I should share my screen if I can. Yes, and I'll disappear okay. here. So, uh... uh oh, I might have a moment to make sure that I can do this. Yeah, I can figure out how to make my accessibility work. Let's hope that works. Okay, let's see if this. Okay, can you see my screen? Hopefully. Can you see my screen? Did, were you able to see my screen or no? Oh, sorry. When you my my mic was off. Uh, okay. No, not yet. <laughs> okay, let me try again. Oh, hang on. Ah, okay. How about that? Mm. No? No, <laughs> not yet. Okay, let me try this again. Okay, hang on. Ah, okay. Sorry, it's going to take me a moment to figure out how to fix this in my preferences. Um, no worries. Let's have a little coffee break or something. <laughs> uh, okay. either. Um, I think there's one other thing I have to do. Hang on. And actually never been on the other side of the presenter, <laughs> so I, I cannot help you. <laughs> I think I, there's two things I had to fix. Hang on. that I might have to quit and start again. Let's see. Ah, they don't make it easy for you, do, do they? No, no, no. Oh, I think it's, yeah. Uh, now yes. It's, yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. That was okay. not the easiest, but uh, okay. Let's hope this works now. All right. You can hear me. Everything's working. Like it's sharing, excellent. Okay, so yes, thanks again, Leticia, for having me. It's, it's really nice. But yes, next time it would be so nice to to be there in person. And I just thought for reminiscent reminiscing purposes, I'd show you this this uh, shot of Toronto. This is Convocation Hall, where we I teach one of my immunology classes, which has about a thousand students. It's pretty insane. But uh, that's the Toronto skyline with the famous CN Tower. Um, so today, what I want to talk about um, is. Uh, 
I guess it's pretty much my favorite subject, which would be um, the role of, of NOD2 in uh, Crohn's disease. Okay, so thinking about uh, innate immune recognition of, of pathogens, uh, we know that there are like two general ways that pathogens are sensed by the cell. And one of them is through these toll-like receptors, through extracellular sensing of these pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So we know that this happens on the, in the extracellular milieu. But the work that we were doing in, in Paris at that time also showed us that these uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns can be detected by intracellular pattern recognition receptors. So both, uh, and now we know both PAMPs as well as these dangerous associated molecular patterns can be um, recognized by these different um, intracellular receptors and lead to cell signaling to cause a defense response that would hopefully, as it, it works properly, um, to get rid of the infection. So these intracellular sensors include things like nod-like receptors, regai-like receptors, uh, in 2 like receptors, the CGAS sting pathway, and also, I guess, the most recent to that family would be the caspases uh, 4, 5, and 11, which have been shown to now bind and signal uh, to intracellular LPS. Um, so my lab, and as uh, you can guess, uh, studies um, the nod-like receptors. And we were really interested in, in looking at how these innate immune uh, pattern recognition receptors um, work in the body is looking at uh, their role in the gut and their role in maintaining uh, the mucosal barrier at this, at this organ. And from literature that's been um, moving along, I'd say, in the last few years, um, it's shown that these intestinal epithelial cells are ignorant for the most part of the microbiota. And this is important because if these cells were sensing these microbes through their release of these pathogen-associated molecular patterns, we'd have this constant inflammatory response uh, going on in our guts. Um, so we know from, from pretty recent research, actually, from um, uh, Greg Barton's lab, where he did kind of a survey of toll-like re uh, receptor uh, expression within the gut, he showed that in the small intestine, there's a, a low expression of most um, TLRs, uh, with the exception of TLR5. But he not only looked at expression, but he also looked at the functional responses of these pattern recognition receptors to PAMPs. Uh, and he showed that really in the small intestine, there's, there's a minimal functional response um, occurring through these toll-like receptors. Uh, in the colon, where there's a you know, much bigger microbiota to, to deal with uh, within that uh, section of the gut, um, he also showed that there's a low expression of TLRs with uh, um, some excep exceptions. And the functional responses uh, were also limited uh, comparatively to what they saw in the small intestine. And this also may be because there's also a high expression of these uh, TLR negative regulators, including things like cigar and tulip, which basically are, are kind of dominant negative molecules that block signaling through these uh, toll-like receptors. But also important to keep in mind, so even though these, these gut epithelial cells are, are kind of ignorant to the extracellular uh, stimulation with these pathogen-associated molecular patterns, uh, intestinal epithelial cells are usually where a lot of pathogens enter into our body, so they want to cross the barrier to enter into the body to cause infection. Um, and so epithelial cells in general are really the, the front line of, of host defense. They have to be able to detect pathogens uh, coming across these different mucosal barriers. Uh, so we think that, therefore, the, um, these intracellular sensors, these cytoplasmic sensors, are important in the recognition of organisms and bacteria that gain entry into the, into the epithelium. So in this kind of uh, strategy, we think that these uh, pathogens that are coming into these epithelial cells again to cross this barrier are recognized um, by pattern recognition receptors, including the nod-like receptors, resulting in a signaling pathway and to get uh, inflammation um, that's generated from this, from this interaction. And then also uh, what we showed is that you also see autophagy targeting of these bacteria and restriction of their growth. So they play a really key role, we think, in, in the defense of these um, barrier surfaces. So this uh, family of cytosolic centers that we're uh, interested in our lab is um, these nod-like receptors that can detect both um, bacteria through uh, PAMP interactions, but also uh, these danger signals. And I don't think I need to go into much detail, but these uh, this family of protein is uh, family of proteins are um, highlighted by this uh, their their domain structure. So you have this C terminal series of leucine rich repeats which in many cases is where that ligand interaction is taking place. And then on the, uh, the intermini are these different interaction domains that allow them to connect to different signaling pathways. 
And within the Nod subfamily, these, this domain, uh, this card domain, allows Nod1 and Nod2 to interact with the NF kappa B signaling pathway. Um, and this uh, defines this, uh, this family, including NLRC3, C5, and X1, which we've also uh, done a lot of work on as well. Um, and the other, um, I'd say, major family within this group is, subfamily within this group is the uh, NLRP proteins, which instead of a card domain have this um, purine domain, which allows them to form these inflammasome molecules that are complexes that allow them to, to uh, process and, and secrete um, cytokines like IL-1 beta and IL-18. So we study um, a lot, uh, NOD1 and NOD2, and um, back when uh, Leticia was in our lab uh, in Paris, we found uh, that these receptors detect peptidoglycan. Um, but interestingly, even though they both generally sense peptidoglycan, they detect distinct motifs within this bacterial product. So NOD1, uh, we showed, uh, detects this uh, amino acid, diaminopamilic acid, so gap-type peptidoglycan, um, uh, shown in this, the minimal structure of uh, the NOD, or not the minimal structure, but a structure of uh, the NOD1 ligand shown here. So you have mesodap within that uh, amino acid within that stem peptide. Um, and this DAP uh, is found mainly in gram-negative bacteria, but also some select uh, gram-positive bacteria. Uh, NOD2, on the other hand, uh, detects, this is the minimal structure for NOD2, which is the miramal dipeptide. Uh, and this is the, the component that's found in, in all bacteria, so gram-negative and gram-positive, making NOD2 uh, more of a general sensor of bacteria through its ability to detect MDP. Uh, and I just wanted to show this is a little extract, uh, the work that Leticia did for, for um, our paper on um, where we showed um, the, the, or we demonstrated what was the ligand for NOD1. And she did some, uh, uh, some, some cytoplasmic uh, injections uh, of these uh, intestinal epithelial cells that we isolated from mice and showed that when she uh, injected this uh, extract of uh, Shigella flexneri into these cells, these are the cells that have been microinjected, she saw that these are the cells that um, have activated NF-kappa B in the nucleus. However, on the other hand, if she used uh, epithelial cells from NOD1 knockout mice, she saw that you couldn't uh, activate NF-kappa B um, uh, by the, the um, microinjection of this gram-negative product. So these data kind of highlighted what we were trying to, to well, actually what we really build on, which is the, the sensing of these bacterial products within the intestinal epithelial cells, which we think is critical for um, host defense. So then back in uh, 2001, um, the NOD2 gene was linked to the development of Crohn's disease. So there were two back-to-back -back papers uh, in Nature that had identified these variants in the NOD2 gene that were associated with increased susceptibility to, to Crohn's disease. Um, so as Crohn's disease is a, is a type of inflammatory um, bowel disease, um, unlike uh, ulcerative colitis, it can affect the entire gastrointestinal tract. And we know that the mutation in NOD2 is responsible for about 30% of cases of Crohn's disease. Um, and upon uh, colonoscopy, so you can see this is the nice uh, interior of the, of the colon in, in uh, healthy individuals. However, those individuals that have Crohn's disease, you see this kind of blistering of the, of the mucosal surface of the, of the uh, colon and all this um, pus uh, accumulating uh, on the surface. Um, and interestingly, this, this disease is, is really um, highly prevalent in Canada. Canada has one of the highest uh, incidences of Crohn's disease um, in the world. So now we know that, you know, NOD2 is the first uh, gene to be identified for Crohn's disease, but now we know that there's over 200 loci that have been associated with Crohn's disease, yet NOD2 remains the most strongly uh, associated genetic uh, factor, and that's uh, shown in this graph here. And when we look, we, we see that uh, homozygous and uh, compound heterozygous uh, patients um, in the NOD2 gene have an approximately 40 times more, or 40 times more likely to develop Crohn's than the rest of, of the population. So we're interested in trying to understand the biology of NOD2 and how we can determine how its dysfunction uh, can lead to um, Crohn's disease and this, this inflammation that we see that's associated with this disease. So just a little bit about the uh, variant in NOD2 that's associated with Crohn's disease. So the strongest um, risk variant that's associated with Crohn's is this uh, frame shift mutation. And this frame shift mutation results uh, in a premature stop codon, 
codon and affects the coding sequence, so there is a lack of expression of the last um, leucine-rich repeat. And we showed early on that this mutation abrogates uh, the ability of NOD2 to sense mere multipeptide. And that's just shown um, in, in this, um, this, these graphs here. So this is a, a collaboration we had with uh, the famous um, Mihai Natea, who's really now famous for looking at the um, memory of innate immunity. Um, with, with the collaboration that we did with um, Mihai, we showed that uh, blood, uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells that were isolated from Crohn's patients and it had the expression of the NOD2 frameshift gene had uh, an inability to sense peptidoglycan. And that's shown in these graphs. So you can see um, when we collected these uh, PBMCs from uh, control individuals, uh, patients that had Crohn's but not the frameshift mutation, or uh, patients that had the frameshift mutation, you can see they have a normal uh, cytokine response to, to LPS, for example. However, when we stimulated those cells with different types of peptidoglycan, you could see that the sensing was, was practically, uh, in most cases, uh, abrogated compared to what you see with patients um, that don't have the frameshift mutation or uh, control individuals. So this really showed that this decreased bacterial sensing uh, led to this hyperinflammatory response during uh, Crohn's disease. And it's really been the work that our lab and, and many other labs uh, have been doing around the world to try to understand this, this, the reason behind this, this massive inflammation response that we see in Crohn's. Um, so one thing we worked on pretty early on uh, during my career was not only looking at this pro-inflammatory role of nod proteins in immunity, but all, also these immunosuppressive effects. And that's just highlighted by um, these data that we published um, recently, where we showed that when you inject uh, the NOD1 ligand, so this is a synthetic ligand uh, that, that activates NOD1, if we inject that into the peritoneal cavity and then look at the induction of cytokines over time, you can see that early on you get a pro-inflammatory response, so characterized by um, the chemokines KC or, or CXCL1, um, IL-6. And then as time goes by and you look after uh, 24 hours um, within the peritoneal cavity, you start to see this induction of more uh, regulatory or anti-inflammatory cytokines. So things like TSLP, um, GMCSF, which uh, we showed um, more recently to be involved in this, this immunosuppression suppression effect, uh, as well as IL-10. Now, when um, the PhD student that was working on this project named Charles, he also looked at the macrophages that he could isolate from the peritoneal cavity of these mice. So this was after 24 hours. And again, you see this, this profile of both uh, pro-inflammatory, so INOS, uh, CCL2 induction, but also then the induction of these more um, regulatory type genes that are uh, associated with more of an um, uh, immunoregulatory phenotype of those macrophages, the so-called uh, M2 macrophages. So things like uh, increase in ARG1, YAM1, and uh, CD206. And this was you know, in the context of, of a lot of other work that we had done uh, in the lab over the years to show that NOD proteins, like I said, even though they have this inflammatory potential, they also drive more of an immunoregulatory phenotype with TH2 immunity, um, we showed more recently um, this GMCSF dependent generation of immunoregulatory um, dendritic cells and this ability uh, of, of NOD1 uh, to create this immunosuppressive tumor environment uh, that promotes tumor uh, progression uh, in a model of colorectal cancer. So this lack of uh, immune uh, regulation in the absence of, of uh, NOD2 function uh, would obviously be a link to the development of Crohn's. So thinking about that, uh, we wanted then to, to look at the potential role of, of NOD proteins, and specifically NOD2, uh, in tissue repair. So our question was, does NOD2 expression within the intestinal epithelium uh, impact restitution of the, of the gut mucosal barrier? And some things that we had to, we're always thinking about uh, in the lab is that, first of all, uh, Crohn's disease associated variants in, are found also in healthy people, so it's not always associated with disease. And also that the NOD2 deficient mice uh, do not show any spontaneous inflammation. So this really suggests that there's environmental factors, one of them being the microbiota that we're very interested in, but a lot of environmental factors that kind of synergize with this um, NOD2 variant in order to, to lead to the development of Crohn's. And I really like this idea that was put forward by um, Kevin uh, Malloy and, and Fiona Powery, where 
IBD really uh, occurs over time after a number of different uh, steps uh, in this, this inflammatory process. So interestingly, they say that the genetic susceptibility is kind of the foundation of uh, the disease, but then other uh, effects have to occur in order to develop the inflammation that is associated with Crohn's. So things like barrier defects, um, dysbiosis or, or bacterial infection or viral infection, uh, you get this sustained immune uh, response which, with um, the consequent defective regulation. And interestingly, thinking about uh, barrier defects, uh, we know that these barrier defects actually precede uh, the development of Crohn's. So this is a paper published um, by our colleagues, uh, Ken Kreutero, uh, who showed that in a genetically susceptible population, uh, barrier defects were actually seen to precede the development of Crohn's disease. So really interesting, again, idea that you get genetic susceptibility linked with a mucosal barrier defect is what drives uh, the development of Crohn's. And I think that's exactly what I said there, non 2 deficiency compounds with this barrier injury, injury to progressively drive uh, disease. So thinking about this then, as I mentioned, we really wanted to understand uh, what is the role of NOD2 within the intestinal uh, epithelium. And going back to, to really old data <laughs> from 2003, uh, you can see that NOD2 uh, is expressed within the intestinal crypts. So these are the crypts of the, of the uh, intestine, and then up here would be um, the villi. And uh, this group used uh, in situ hybridization to show uh, the expression of NOD2 uh, concentrated in the cells uh, present in the crypts uh, compared to their negative control. And just to orient you, uh, this is a, the a picture or a cartoon of the small intestinal crypt with the um, associated cell types that are within the crypt. Uh, so you have these uh, differentiated uh, enterocytes that cover the entire uh, villi of the small intestine. Uh, and then within the crypt, you have the, the transit amplifying uh, progenitor cells. So these are the cells that uh, can divide and also uh, differentiate into the different cell types within the epithelium. And then down in the crypt, there are these, uh, what we call the LGR5 positive intestinal uh, stem cells. And these are the cells that are uh, cycling and they provide the, um, the cells and the, and the proliferation of those cells that can, um, that can allow for the turnover of the epithelium, which happens every three to five days uh, within the intestine. So these are these, these rapidly cycling, uh, again, what we call LGR5 positive uh, stem cells. Uh, also within the crypt are these uh, panacells. So panacells, as you know, secrete these antimicrobial peptides uh, into this crypt region and, and maintain this area relative, relatively sterile compared to what you'd see at the top of the villi where there would be um, a number of bacteria within the microbiota. But also importantly, uh, and this is a bit controversial, so I'm going to get into it in, in a moment more, but there's also this uh, quiescent uh, stem cell population that uh, originally was, was marked uh, are thought to be marked by this uh, BMI1. And these cells uh, are only called into play when you have an uh, injury within the intestine and damage of these cycling stem cells. So these cells are really key for the regeneration of the intestine after uh, intestinal injury. So uh, our uh, previous um, uh, supervisor, Philippe Sansonetti, uh, had looked at the expression of NOD2 within the crypts of the, of the intestine and he showed that NOD2 was expressed relatively high within the stem cell population compared to the other cells within the crypts. And we also built on this to show that uh, not only is NOD2 expressed uh, more highly in these LGR5 positive cycling stem cells, but also these uh, quiescent uh, stem cells. And this is compared to the other uh, crypt epithelial cells. So this gave us the idea that we were interested in understanding whether NOD2 plays a functional role within these stem cell populations. So to look at this in, in vitro, we use this protocol of uh, generating um, these gut organoids. So these are like mini guts. I'll just show you a picture of them there. So that's an immunofluorescent picture of these um, gut organoids. And what we do is we isolate crypts, uh, small intestine or uh, colon from mice. And then we grow these uh, crypts within a matrix gel um, uh, uh, compound and, and, and media. And these uh, cells then form into what we call uh, these organoids. So these are like these three-dimensional structures. And you can see that they have these buds um, off the center lumen. And these buds are where uh, the stem cells reside and, and proliferate and allow for the, the progressive uh, growth of, of these or organoids um, over time. 
Uh, and they also secrete, they're also made up of all the epithelial cell populations that we know in the intestine, including uh, goblet cells. And you can see the secretion of mucus that's accumulating within the interior of these uh, organoids. So to look at the role of NOD2, uh, we developed this model um, uh, where you can, we call it dissociation injury, where you take the CRIPS and then you look at the recovery over time. And when you plate a known uh, number of these CRIPS, we can then count how many organoids are formed from these CRIPS after um, uh, this recovery period. And when we did this with um, wild type versus NOD2 knockout um, CRIPS, you can see that the number of organoids uh, form are fewer in the NOD2 knockout mice compared to the wild type mice. And this is also true when we knocked NOD2 specifically out of that um, quiescent stem cell population. So this is kind of the first indication that perhaps NOD2 is playing a role within these quiescent stem cells to allow for proper um, regeneration of the epithelium. And we, when we knocked NOD2 with, out of these cells, then we saw this inability to form um, and efficiently form these, these organoids compared to what we saw with the wild type mice. So NOD2 seems to be promoting uh, the, the survival and also the formation of these organoids. So how do we take this now uh, into vivo? So that's what we wanted to do next. And we used um, a method of uh, gamma irradiation of these mice. And the reason why this gamma radiation is, is, uh, is a good model is because it ablates all the crypt cells within, within the base of the, of the, uh, within the base of the crypt. So all the cells within there are ablated, including those LGR5 positive uh, stem cells that, that allow for this uh, regeneration. So what this does is it really calls into play those quiescent stem cells. And using this model, we can really focus on the role of those quiescent stem cells in the regeneration of the intestine over time. So we ablate these uh, uh, columnar base uh, crypt cells, and then we allow the animal to recover and then look at the intestine over time. So we did this experiment in uh, mice that locked, lacked NOD2 within the intestinal epithelium. So just to show you, we see nice uh, ablation of NOD2 within um, the epithelial cells of these animals. And then again, we look at the recovery of the intestine over time. And you can see already that uh, just by H and E staining, there are more uh, crypts that are forming at day four uh, in the wild type mice compared uh, to the knockout mice. And when we looked at this uh, um, more quantitatively using uh, BRDU staining, so BRDU will be incorporated into those proliferating um, epithelial cells, we could see that uh, there was always um, the, the regeneration of the, of the mice that lacked NOD2 within the intestinal epithelial cells was always uh, slower than what we saw with the wild type cells. And this began at day three and, and uh, was, was significant at day four. We see the significant uh, uh, change in the number of BRDU positive cells within those mice that lack NOD2 within the intestinal epithelium. So it seems like these mice have an impaired uh, regenerative response and delayed pr proliferation uh, following this radiation induced um, injury. So the next question then, how can we focus on the role of NOD2 in intestinal stem cells? So now I'm going to go back to, to a little bit more detail on those quiescent stem cells because one of our colleagues, uh, Jeff Rana, uh, showed, um, I guess it was 2019 already, um, showed the, uh, the importance of what they call the revival stem cell in this process. So they found these revival stem cells seem to be the cells that are uh, induced following injury and required for the regeneration of the intestine after a, a major injury. So these revival stem cells, as they call them, are marked by uh, this, this uh, protein called clusterin on their cell surface or CLU positive. Importantly, they're LGR5 negative, so they are not the uh, rapidly cycling uh, stem cells. And they're very transiently uh, found within the intestine, so they're injury induced. So we see them after irradiation but also after um, DSS-induced uh, colitis. Um, they in arise uh, very early after irradiation, peak at about three days post-irradiation. And as I mentioned, they're very uh, transient within the, the epithelial population. We could find at baseline a few of these clue positive cells, um, but it's really only after a major injury that you see the induction of these, of these quiescent stem cells to allow for the regeneration of the epithelium. So we wanted to then see if we could focus on NOD2 and see if it had a role within these revival stem cells to promote recovery from injury. 
So the way we started to look at this was to look at the global impact of NOG deficiency on the intestinal epithelium, both at baseline and after irradiation. So with um, the help of um, Arshad Ayaz and, and Jeff Rana uh, here in Toronto, we wanted we decided to do a single cell RNA seq of the of the crypt, so focusing just on the crypt epithelial cells, and to look at um, whether NOD2 played a role in this recovery process by functioning within these uh, stem cells. So what we did is we again used this uh, irradiation model and uh, sacked the mice at three days post irradiation, where we know we see the um, the, the the most uh, highest induction of clue positive cells at this time. Um, and then we did a uh, single cell RNA-seq on these uh, isolated crypt epithelial cells. And just basic things to look at is what we found was uh, there was a similar uh, proportion of epithelial cells um, at baseline and at three days post radiation uh, in the wild type mice and the NOD2 knockout mice. So just you can see here when we looked at cell number uh, as well as the percent of these different epithelial cells, there was not much different difference between these uh, cell populations between the wild type uh, mice, which are in gray and black, and the NOD2 uh, knockout mice, which are uh, in red. Importantly, uh, as we were happy to see, that we saw the, the, a really nice induction of these revival stem cells only in those mice um, that, uh, following the irradiation protocol. So just overall, we saw a similar proportion of epithelial cell types and the induction of these revival stem cells in both wild type and, and non 2 deficient crypts. So then looking at the, um, the expression profile of genes um, uh, within the non 2 deficient cells compared to wild type, not surprisingly, when we, we looked at um, antimicrobial peptide expression, these were highly uh, different in wild type, not wild type mice compared to, to wild, uh, wild type mice. So you can see here in the different uh, epithelial cell clusters that there's a decreased expression of a number of these uh, antimicrobial peptides, alpha defensins, uh, lysozyme, triple factor, and intellectin-1. These were all decreased in expression uh, in the NOD2 knockout mice compared to the wild type when we looked at the CRIPS. And this was not surprising because there ha have been studies to show that these antimicrobial peptides are, are um, induced by uh, NOD2 signaling. So this was, was reassuring to us uh, that, that uh, the the single cell worked nicely and we saw what we expected, which was this decrease in antimicrobial peptide expression. Um, and this, as we know uh, from previous studies and something that we're looking more into at the moment, is that this reduced uh, antimicrobial expression is linked uh, uh, to perhaps a lack of protection of the epithelial barrier. Now, when we focus on uh, these, these stem cells, uh, both these uh, LGR5 positive stem cells, which are found here, as well as these uh, revival stem cells. And we looked at um, NOD2 expression um, uh, within these, these uh, uh, cells. Actually, sorry, this is first looking at uh, LGR5 and CLU. So LGR5 was where we expected it to be uh, induced uh, in these cells. So it was within the um, LGR5, those rapidly cycling stem cells within the intestine, which is the cluster we show here. And this was similar between wild type and NOD2 knockout mice. And then we looked at the clue expression, as uh, nicely shown, uh, was in the revival stem cell population uh, shown here. So clue cells were also nicely induced um, in both the wild type crypts as well as the NOD2 knockout crypts. We then focused on um, NOD2 expression within these populations. And it was really in these, only highly in these uh, populations where we saw the induction of NOD2. So these LGR5 positive sub cells, we, we didn't really see expression of NOD2. But again, when we focused in on those clue positive revival stem cells, that's where we saw NOD2 induction. So what we think is happening is that NOD2 expression overall, as we've seen, is, is pretty low uh, in the intestine at baseline. But under these uh, injury conditions where you're having the induction of these revival stem cells to promote repair, that's where we then see uh, increased NOD2 expression within the intestinal crypts. Um, so that was by a uh, single cell and, and, and looking at that, but we had to then uh, confirm it and we used uh, in situ hybridization, this RNA scope technique to look at clue expression and NOD2 uh, co-expression within the intestinal epithelium. Uh, 
And again, at baseline, as I mentioned, we saw very little, uh, well, very little clue expression and also very little uh, NOD2 expression. So some of the immune cells within the lamina propria seem to be expressing NOD2, but not very much in the uh, epithelium. However, at this three days post irradiation, you see this really nice induction of clue, which is in purple here. But we also saw that many of these cells also um, express NOD2. So it seems as though NOD2 is a uh, expression is induced at the peak of clue revival stem cell induction uh, following this radiation in injury model. And now what we were really interested in doing is, is seeing the, the specific role of NOD2 within these uh, stem cells. So we're crossing these mice, the Fox NOD2 mice currently, with mice uh, expressing CRE under the, the clue promoter. So those data are still to come. Um, what we now wanted to, to think about was is it a, a functional effect of NOD2 within these revival stem cells? Is that uh, important? So looking at if NOD2 signaling can affect uh, the proliferation or expansion of these revival stem cells, we again turned uh, to the organoid model. And to do this experiment, we took mice that express uh, GFP under the, the uh, control of CLU. So these GFP clue organoids, and then we treated these organoids with a chemotherapeutic agent, this uh, five uh, fluorouracil, and five FU is used in, in cancer treatment because it, it basically kills rapidly dividing cells. And we know from previous uh, experiments in our lab as well as in the lab of Jeff Rana that this five FU treatment induces the, um, the these revival stem cells and their expansion. So we wanted to ask in this kind of a model, if we add the NOD ligand uh, MDP, NOD2 ligand MDP, would it have an effect on the expansion of these cells uh, in this uh, type of model? So again, we took these CLU, uh, CLU uh, GFP expressing organoids and then treated them both with 5-FU and in the presence of an absence of MDP, so the ligand for NOD2, and then looked by flow cytometry at the expression of uh, clue uh, within those uh, different cell populations. And what we found is looking at the frequency of, of uh, high expressing clue cells, we saw it first as we uh, uh, have seen before and, and uh, nicely uh, replicated the data that we had with 5-FU, that you see an induction of these clue positive cells after this treatment. And then when we included MDP in this uh, in the media, we saw that after if I, if 5-FU treatment as well as MDP, that we saw an even higher increase of these uh, clue uh, GFP expressing cells. So consistent with the idea that uh, signaling through NOD2 is helping to uh, expand and, and promote the, the, the presence of these revival stem cells, which will then lead to uh, regeneration and uh, repair of the intestinal epithelium. So what we wanted then to do is to, to look at in this case, so then if NOD2 is promoting this expansion and, this, and the health of these revival stem cells, what defines uh, a NOD2 deficient stem cell? Like what kind of um, um, markers or, or patterns can we see within those NOD2 deficient uh, revival stem cells that might be consistent with the fact that these intestinal organoids have a hard time recovering if they lack NOD2? So when we did this uh, GoTerm enrichment analysis comparing wild type uh, and Clue, uh, NOD2 clue positive revival stem cells. What was interesting to us is that within the NOD2 uh, deficient CRIPS, we saw this signature of uh, cell stress. So again, we're focusing in on these revival stem cells, comparing wild type and, and NOD2 knockout mice. And uh, looking at these uh, different gene signatures, the NOD2 knockout mice, um, uh, the signatures associated with the NOD2 knockout revival stem cells were these um, signatures of cell stress, so oxidative stress, uh, the induction of, of um, viral associated uh, genes, uh, as well as genes involved in the apoptotic process um, and uh, uh, proliferation, uh, as I've told here. So oxidative stress, viral responses to viral infection uh, cell cycle and apoptosis were the were the signatures that seem to be um, more associated with the NOD2 knockout revival stem cells compared to the wild type. And just showing um, this in a, in a heat map, so comparing the NOD2 deficient revival stem cells and the wild, two, not wild type revival stem cells, 
Uh, so you can see there's a, a higher induction of these oxidative stress genes, as well as a number of uh, interferon uh, signaling genes, so uh, these ISGs that are um, character, character, characteristic of uh, a response to viral infection. So things like ISG15 uh, and IFIT-M3 were increased in the NOD2 deficient revival stem cells compared to wild type. And interestingly, it had already been shown that kind of consistent with this increased uh, oxidative uh, stress response, that there's high cytosolic ROS in NOD2 knockout uh, organoids. And that was shown here. So this is again, a, a a recent paper by um, uh, Philippe Cincinnati's group showing when he, they looked at um, oxidative uh, stress and, and measured um, ROS accumulation within these um, organoids, that the NOD2 knockout organoids had a higher level of ROS compared to wild type. And even uh, also a, a high level ROS was also seen in uh, ATG1601, which is another gene we were very interested in uh, because of its, also, uh, its similar association with Crohn's disease. And just to uh, verify some of those um, signals uh, using uh, immunohistochemistry and, and tissue techniques, we looked at the expression of um, ISG15 within the epithelium following this irradiation protocol. So after the irradiation, you can see there's uh, some induction of ISG15 within the intestine of uh, wild type mice, but you see a lot more of the induction of this ISG15 in the NOD2 mice that in the mice that lack NOD2 within the intestinal epithelium, and uh, these are data that we're still uh, generating, but it looks like there's a trend at least to increased ISG expression in the NOD2 uh, deficient animals. So this kind of reveals that there seems to be a heightened type 1 interferon response and we're thinking that this is linked to an increased dam DNA damage response that's happening within these cells. And this is also um, uh, supported by recent literature that has shown that uh, genome instability and also uh, other types of DNA damage uh, affect the um, regeneration of the intestine after injury. Okay, so in summary, uh, we showed that these NOD2 deficient CRIPS have a reduced uh, regenerative capacity, both in organoids uh, and in vivo. Um, our single cell RNA-seq analysis revealed that there was a diminished production of these antimicrobial uh, peptides uh, in NOD2 deficient CRIPS. As I mentioned, that's something that's been uh, seen before. And NOD2 is expressed within these uh, revival stem cells and kind of links this decreased epithelial regeneration that we see in NOD2 deficient mice, mice after irradiation and suggests that this is because of dysfunctional stem cells. And these NOD2 deficient stem cells have the signature of cell stress, uh, this what we think is increased DNA damage, and we're thinking that this might be due to a lack of NOD2 driven autophagy within the cells. And this is uh, work that we're, we're uh, currently doing to try to, to understand the mechanism behind these observations. So, just putting that all together, we really think that the deficiency of NOD2 uh, compromises the epithelial barrier and leads to poor restitution po post injury. So, as we showed, that um, lack of NOD2 within the intestinal crypt. You have the reduced production of these antimicrobial peptides. And as I mentioned, those are really uh, important to protect uh, the barrier against um, microbes that might be trying to get down uh, into the crypt. Usually this area is quite sterile. So we think microbes are starting to come into the crypt to damage the epithelium. So then you see um, an increased uh, permeability or getting damaged epithelial cells, uh, barrier dysfunction that then leads to the inflammatory response. But at the same time, what we showed is that within these uh, revival stem cell population, that when you don't have NOD2, you start to see this uh, interferon, type 1 interference signature, increased in ox oxidative stress. And this uh, also leads to a compromised epithelial recovery because these cells cannot proliferate and regenerate well enough to try to repair um, the damage of that injury. And then together, we think both of these uh, features then can lead to the, develop the inflammation that we see in the development of Crohn's disease. Okay, so thanks is due to, to many people uh, over the years who have uh, shown here, all the alumni uh, as part of my lab and, and Steph's lab. Uh, and most of the work that I mentioned uh, today was uh, started by um, a previous PhD student, Charles Maisonneuve. Uh, who has now moved on and, and is now doing uh, postdoctoral work. Uh, and a, a PhD student, Derek Sang, who's, who's taken over from him and done all the RNA-seq analysis 
uh, excellent, uh, both are excellent, excellent students. Collaborators are, are uh, Jeff Rana, uh, just across the street from us. And of course, all this work is done uh, in collaboration with uh, the lab uh, and life partner, uh, Stefan Scherharda. Okay, I'll end there and uh, take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. Thank as you. usually, as usually, very nice presentation, beautiful data, and very clear presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I was wondering, um, you you kind of, you know, mentioned in your last slide that that's what you're doing, but because uh, that would be uh, the stress lead. I mean, injury leads to stress, mm -hmm. and then if you don't have not to somehow stress is not controlled and it leads to what you're saying. So do you right. think that's to do with autophagy that will release this stress? I, I, the, the data from Philippe's lab um, that I showed in the organoids where they also showed that ROS was also high in the ATG16L1 um, organoids is suggestive that it's perhaps a similar pathway. Uh, so it's something we're, we're really trying to figure out right now because you know, when I think about not to, it kind of goes in two directions. It's either like an NF-kappa B classical inflammatory response, um, which also might be uh, cytoprotective because we know that NF-kappa B, there's a lot of cytoprotective type um, um, genes that are expressed downstream of that pathway. Um, and then you also have the autophagy pathway. So that's what we need to figure out next is, uh, you know, this type one interferon response that we we're seeing perhaps due to increased DNA damage you know, is it controlled uh, through an NF-kappa B pathway or is it controlled through an autophagy pathway? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's something we, we need to still try to, you know, tease apart those two different mechanisms. Hopefully we'll figure that out. That would be really, really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for this uh, not to roll on these uh, revival stem cells, uh, do you think, I mean, we? You, you mentioned, and it's very clear, the role of uh, not to recognition of peptidoglycan and, and the consequences of that. But do you think in this case, um, it's really driven by a, a recognition of peptidoglycan or it, it's in some signaling pathway that once the injury is done, then it's part of something that even if you don't have the peptidoglycan, it will just go on? That's a yeah, that's the question. I, I, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. You know, what is it? Is it uh, ligand dependent or independent, right? I always think it's in, it's dependent. Like everything we've seen with mod proteins so far, even in weird, you know, types of effects that people have published, I think you can always say that there is a ligand present in, the, in those situations. So the kind of thing I'm thinking is that, you know, we have that, well, first of all, I think, that the expression of NOD2 seems to be controlled within that revival stem cell population. So it seems to only be induced upon this major injury response, which means that, you know, at that moment, it then is available to detect ligands. And it's not really doing much, I guess, at baseline. Maybe we'll see about that. Um, and then so this induction of, of NOD2 expression and perhaps the fact that, you know, as I mentioned, the bacteria are coming closer down into the crypt when you lack NOD2 and you lack this antimicrobial peptide expression, maybe you have more MDP within that area now, and that signals this response. Um, so my favorite idea would be that, and that perhaps the NF-kappa B is somehow inducing a, a cytoprotective response within those revival stem cells, which is not too driven, but that still remains to be seen. Uh, I think it's a huge controversy in the field, right? The Is the ligand dependent versus independent functions of, of actually all pattern recognition receptors. Yeah, sure. I think it's all driven by ligand, but I always tell my my PhD student, Charles, uh, he was always like thinking it was independent. I said like, prove it. If you prove it to me, I'll be happy, right? So, but he wasn't able to yet, but yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, so there is a comment and a question from Vinicius. Excellent talk, Dana. Really interesting data. I was wondering if the increase of Clu plus cells, positive cells, is also IL-22 dependent, since it's a role in promoting barrier function. Yeah, very good point. 
um, IL-2 is, is IL-22 is certainly extremely important within uh, promoting the barrier function. Um, I, I think it, it likely contributes at some level, but I guess the fact that we saw some of these effects in the absence of any cells, we saw this only with epithelial cells. And to my knowledge, I don't, we've never seen IL-22 being pr produced by epithelial cells. So I think in the organoid model, you know, we, we can exclude the effects of IL-22. But I think for sure, like you're, you're suggesting, I think in the in vivo model, when you have, you know, all the macrophages and ILCs and all that stuff within that compartment as well, that IL-22 probably helps contribute to that response in vivo, for sure. Good, good question. And the other question, uh, would not to knock out develop spontaneous disease under non-SPF conditions? We're doing that experiment right now, actually. That's 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 very cool. One of my uh, PhD students, um, we we're really interested in the microbiota, so that's you know this this, this question is is really close to my heart at the moment because uh, what we decided to do is to you know as I mentioned under SPF uh, conditions you don't see any inflammation, so can a dysbiotic microbiota have some uh, effect? So what um, Giuliano has been doing in my lab is he's been um, colonizing mice with defined microbial communities. We have this really nice collaboration with um, uh, Emma and Alan Verco, who's at the university just down, well, okay, an hour and a half down the road from us. And she has these defined communities or, or even isolated organisms that we can add uh, to these defined um, colonized mice. So we have mice that have a certain uh, colonization, uh, I think there's about 20 microbes, so we know everybody in there. And then what we can do is then add some known pathobionts to that to that microbiota. So we've been adding things like um, uh, Bacteroides uh, fragilis, uh, this other uh, bacteria. Um, so that that's kind of the idea. Can we, you know, tip the balance if we add a pathobiont to now cause more inflammation in the non 2 knockout mice? So we'll see. That's the uh, we're hoping that we see something. We had some hints that maybe one of the, one of these bacteria um, might be causing more inflammation in the non two knockout. So keep posted. We'll, we'll we'll hopefully see something in the future. But good question. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions from students? We we we're having a super busy day because the Brazilian. Uh, immunology meeting is happening today oh my week, gosh and the workshop in inflammation so we're kind of divided in many things oh my and I see like thousands of email people asking me if this will be recorded if they can watch <laughs> later so just uh, so uh once again then i want to thank you so much uh i was really happy to see so i'll stop transmission now and then i'll we'll just have like a few minutes to say goodbye Sure. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, great questions. Thank you.